For the last few weeks, we've been examining uh, the five acts of worship, and we've already talked about the Lord's Supper, and last week we introduced and talked about uh, the singing and worship in our services. And the last Sunday, we also looked at how and what that is. In other words, we looked at what's the purpose of our singing worship in, in, in our worship service. Uh, we saw that it was to praise God, and, and it had a secondary effect to edify the church, the body of Christ. And then we looked at what, the, what manner we are supposed to be going ahead and, and accomplishing that in. And we talked about how it needed to have a specific focus, it needed to be in spirit and truth, and that it needed to be with understanding, that we needed to understand the things that we are singing also mean, doing it in sincerity of heart, meaning what we, we say. Now, although we reviewed the, the rationale briefly about what Christ uh, goes ahead and commands us, what we see within the scriptures is commanded and the limited manner in which we're supposed to go ahead and partake of that song service, that worship service, in regards to not having accompanying of music with it, there are many who argue against this, who argue that the restricting of songs purely to the a cappella is wrong and is not biblically correct. And they offer a host of, of reasons why that is. And as we looked in in First in I'm sorry in Colossians chapter three verse seventeen, where we are told, and we just sung about whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. We need to make an effort to ensure that we are doing everything in accordance to the scriptures. And therefore, today I wanted to go ahead and address some of those arguments that are made for instrumental music in order uh, to answer the question, the specific question, instrumental music, instrumental music, why not? Now, before we look at the arguments on why this is, why we do not go ahead and support the, the use of instrumental music, I believe it's, it's key for us. It's, it's, in, it's very important for us to fundamentally look at the, the one pure fact, the fact that kind of ties everything together, and that is that God, God desires and he accepts only one type of worship. Now, we sung just this morning, and I really appreciate the song uh, selection that Alex chose here. The, one of the songs that we sung right before the communion was uh, to go ahead and, it was called True Worship. And it looked at the verse that you are going ahead and turning to right now. You know, the bottom line is we are to worship the Lord in true worship. That that's the only type of worship that the Lord accepts and expects from each one of us. In John chapter 4, if you're not there, go ahead and turn there. In John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, John goes ahead and tells us that Christ says to the Samaritan woman, <clears throat> but an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, in verse 24, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. As we touched on last week, the fact is that God sets his conditions, his standards, for how he wishes for us to worship him what he accepts, and what he expects from us. Christ goes ahead and relays here in verse 23 that to, the, to the Samaritan woman that there is an hour coming and it is now. We are in that now. We are worshiping in the manner that Christ has already specifically specified in this area. That is, our worship needs to be acceptable to God because it needs to first have that right focus. We need to have the right object to our worship. We need to be thinking and relaying all of our worship towards God. And that it needs to be with the right heart. That it needs to be conducted in spirit. It needs to be with the inner man. That it needs to be with our minds engaged and understanding what we're doing. And then it also needs to be guided by the truth, the only truth, and that is the word of God. Now, anything that deviates from this standard, that specific kind of standard, we need to understand is not true worship. And it's important that we understand that specific point because the scriptures also talk about other forms of worship. It talks about other forms of worship that we might find ourselves engaging in if we're not careful. So let's look at the three other types of worship that the scriptures go ahead and identify for us. The first one is vain worship. 
Here we see in Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, if you turn there. Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9. Here, Christ is going ahead and he is talking to the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees are questioning Christ's disciples and Christ himself. And they're asking, why are your disciples not eating with the ceremoniously hands washed? A tradition that they had established to ensure that they were not being contaminated. Uh, and he goes ahead and he says in verse 8, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrine the precepts of men. Here, Christ going ahead and he centers in on the fact that, okay, you're talking about my disciples not following a tradition that you have established, but you don't even follow the commandments of the Lord. And what he is talking, he's telling them specifically, the one point that he's making is one of the things that they were supposed to be doing is honoring their father and mother. They were supposed to go ahead and provide for them when they came to, to that age when they couldn't take care of themselves. But what they were doing was by tradition, they were saying, well, this money is reserved for Corbett. It is reserved for God and therefore is committed to him and I can't go ahead and give that money to you. And they were therefore violating God's word by going around God's word and putting their own traditions in place of God's word, above God's word. And here, Paul, uh, where we see Christ goes ahead and he says, because of that, this is classified as vain worship. But it wasn't just that they were putting their traditions above God, but also that they were not doing it in a sincere manner. It wasn't from their heart. He says that their hearts were far from me. In other words, they were not being sincere. They were saying one thing. They were saying the good things. They were saying they praise God and they worship God, but they were not doing the things that God had commanded, and therefore they weren't showing those things. Can we be guilty of the exact same thing? See, when we adopt traditions over the commandments of God or attempt to render worship, but we don't really do it in a sincere manner. We, we sing that we do in all things and we're to do all in the name of the Lord, but do we do those things? Are we following that practice? When we say one thing and do another, we are not honoring the Lord in that sincere manner. Our hearts are far from the Lord. But also, including, just as we see in vain worship, we can also see ignorant worship. Look with me in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 22 to 23. In Acts chapter 17, here you have Paul going ahead and talking to the men of Athens. He comes into Athens and he looks and he sees the city is covered with all different types of idolatry. And he goes to the Aragopagus and he, he is going to preach the word of God. He's talking to them about the God that they don't know. And he says in verse 22, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. And that word religious in some translations have it as superstitious. He says, I observe that you are very superstition in all, uh, superstitious in all uh, respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Here, Paul speaking to those men of Athens on uh, what we call Mars Hill, he tells them that they were worshiping a God that they did not know. And what the men of Athens, the people of Athens were doing was in order to make sure that they weren't offending any God that they didn't know, they set up an altar and they inscribed it to an unknown God so that it covered any God that they didn't cover in any of their idolatry. And this way they were covered. They were good. They were worshiping that God. And then the God wouldn't go ahead and do anything to them. And here Paul tells them, not knowing, not having knowledge of the God that you're worshiping, not having understanding of what he is asking of you, and not worshiping him in the way that he has prescribed, is ignorant worship. And we can be guilty of the very same thing. You see, when we lean upon our own knowledge and determine what God desires, not based upon the scriptures, but based upon what I think, what I feel it might work better or God might like, when I start looking at my interpretations of however I think that God will, will choose to be worshipped and then insert that over God's word and not even try and look at then I am worshipping ignorantly. And therefore, it is not to be accepted by God. 
Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25, Solomon tells us this. He says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You see, we can't hope to understand God's mind. We can't hope to have the knowledge and the understanding that God has. And therefore, if we just decide willy-nilly we're going to go ahead and, and just worship God in the way that we think that he will like, then we are always going to go wrong. Because the simple truth is the only way we know God's mind, the only way we know, uh, have a glimpse on the things that he wants of us is through the scripture. And we must follow those things. But, okay, we've looked at the true worship. We looked at vain worship. We've looked at ignorant worship. The next and last one we'll see is will worship. Look with me in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Here, Paul, going ahead and talking to the, the saints at Colossae, he goes ahead and he tells them this. If you had died with Christ to the elementary principles of the word, world why as if you were living in the world do you submit yourselves to the, to the decrees such as do not handle do not taste do not touch in verse 22 he says which all refer to the things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and the teachings of men these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion self and self-abased and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. What is Paul saying here? Paul says that this worship that we are talking about here, this, this self-made worship, and if you see some translations, the King James Version, the American uh, Standard Version, as well as the Young's Little Translation, they, worship, they translate that as uh, not only self-made worship, but will worship. And he says, this will worship of yours, it's closely aligned to that vain worship that we just talked about. You don't have a knowledge of the Lord. But more importantly, it's not just that you don't have knowledge. See, it appears to be showing that wisdom of God. But the problem is that instead of going ahead and having the right focus, being God, the focus has become yourself. The focus has become on what you want, what you like, what you desire. It has become a self-worship. Thayer, uh, uh, J.H. Thayer notes this about will worship. He says, worship will, uh, this, this type of worship is one that devises and prescribes for himself contrary to the contents and nature of the faith which ought to be directed by God or by Christ. What he's saying is that this type of worship is essentially just me doing what I like. I'm aiming the worship. I'm saying I'm worshiping Christ or I'm worshiping God, but in reality, I'm doing what I prefer. And can we be guilty of this very same thing? Absolutely. When we go ahead and we center our worship on self-centered worship, that's exactly what we're doing. When we're going ahead and worshiping the Lord based upon what we like or what we think is good or what feels good to me, that is will worship. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Last week, I received a flyer in the mail, and it was a, a, a promotion for one of the churches that, that are in my area. And on this flyer, it, it talked about the different things that they have for the people. And it talks about, okay, on the back, it says, you know, we will worship the Lord. But on the other side, it gave a host of the things, the amenities that they give. And let me just list off some of these amenities that were included in the picture uh, display, the collage that it had. There was daycare. There was bands. There was video game rooms for kids. There was an appearance of what appeared to be a dance party for teens, an upcoming what they classified as a candy palooza. And of course, you had a scan bar where it was a free gift for free, free time, uh, first time visitors. Now. When you look at this, that nowhere in that, that entire brochure did it say, come and worship the Lord. Nowhere did it say, we need to do the Lord's word. We need to praise and give glory to God. No, instead it was aimed towards self-indulgence. 
towards all the things that would draw people in, the things that we like to do, video games and dancing and, and all music and the stuff that, that kind of brings us in there. The kind of things that, again, Paul says is that we'll worship, all based upon what I want. But when we look in the New Testament, the real question then begins to kind of point its pictures. When we are talking about the worship service, when we're talking about singing, do we have anywhere in the scriptures where it tells us in the New Testament that we are to go ahead and utilize instrumental music? And I'm going to give you just off the bat, the answer is no. When we look at all of the different verses that we have within the New Testament, the New Testament shows us there is zero, not one of those verses talking about singing or talking about the worship service ever says anything about instrumental music. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and briefly go through this list. And we're not going to go ahead and turn to it. I'm going to go through it very quickly. But if you desire any of these, I can go ahead and produce a handout for you. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 30, here we have Jesus. After he goes ahead and institutes the Lord's Supper, we're told that he and his disciples sing a hymn of praise to the Lord. And then they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, here we have Paul and Silas after they're beaten and thrown into prison and put into stocks. They are both praying and giving praise to the Lord. No instruments included. In Romans chapter 15, verse 9, Paul going ahead and talking about the, the fact that Gentiles have been accepted into the gospel. He gives this quote from 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 50, where he says, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing your name. Again, no instruments. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, Paul going ahead and he says, the things that you're doing with the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the tongues that you're receiving, you're doing it incorrectly. And he says, the whole point is for the people to understand so that they can be edified. And he says, I will therefore pray with the spirit and then I will pray with the mind also. And I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Once again, no mention of instruments. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19 and Colossians chapter 3 verse 16, we see that we are to sing with our hearts and make melody with our hearts. And that we are to sing with grace in our hearts. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 12, we're told that Christ with his people those that are in Christ, that he will go ahead and praise God. He will sing praises to the Lord. Once again, no instruments are mentioned. And then James chapter 5, verse 13. James tells us that those who are suffering need to go ahead and pray. And those who are cheerful, he says, need to sing praises to God. Once again, no instruments. Now, these last verses that you see here in Revelation, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, 5, 9, and 14, as well as 15, we're going to talk about later on in the, the lesson. So I'm going to hold those because there's some specific information that I want to give you from that. But once again, I can tell you none of those verses are talking, talking about worshiping in our assembly and are talking about instrumental music being used in that sense. So keeping all that in mind, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Because here we're going to go ahead and we see the justification that is given to us on how we are supposed to go ahead and do or perform or conduct our song service. We're told that we are to speak to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Now here we're told that the specific thing, the act that we're supposed to do is sing. And then we're given a qualifier for that action. We're told not only to sing, but to sing and make melody in our hearts. That is the method in which we're supposed to do. And that brings us to the very first argument that we have. See, the very first argument, the justification that some will use for instrumental music, comes from the very word that we see in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. But you don't see it, do you? Because in the Greek, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, that word melody there, that word melody comes from the Greek word is salo. And that salo means to pluck off, to pull out, to twang or twitch, to make melody or to sing. 
In other words, it gives reference to a possibility of it being instrumental music. And that's the argument. The argument is here in the very word, it goes ahead and talks about instrumental music and therefore it justifies instruments being used. Now there's a, a couple of problems with that argument. The first problem is the word solo in the New Testament never refers to instruments, not once. Every, in the Old Testament, there was uh, the use of this word solo is used for instrumental music. But in the New Testament, all scholars that have reviewed this, they go ahead and they point to the fact that solo is never used for instruments. So why is that important? It's important because when we look at this word, then it tells us that it is not associated with instrumental music within the New Testament. As a matter of fact, in some of those verses that we looked at, Romans chapter 15, verse 9, and 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, it is always used as either songs or melody. In, in, uh, in James chapter 5, verse 13, when he goes ahead and he says, those who are cheerful need to sing. That's that word solo. In, in, Rome, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, when he says, I will then sing with the Spirit, I will also sing with my mind, that word solo is being used. Do you see, each and every time, it is not talking about instruments, it is talking about singing. But secondly, on top of this word, if we are to go ahead and utilize this as the justification, then we have to understand what we're saying. You see... If we are saying that instrumental music comes from that word, then that means that every single person within the church must not only sing, but also play an instrument. Well, how is that possible? Because in Ephesians 5, verse 19, the, the response or what Paul is saying is aimed towards each person within the church. He is saying that we need to sing and make melody in our hearts. That is not a church function that you sit out there and listen to the music. That is you singing and then making that melody. So if we're saying that this is instruments, that means that every single person needs to also be able to sing and make music with that instrument, which makes no sense. Not even within the Old Testament do we see that. But let's look at the third one. In the third one, we see only uh, if this was to go ahead and be, okay, we're going to go off of that word solo and means twang, to, to twitch, to pluck, or to pluck off, and it means the, the instrument. What is the instrument that Paul goes ahead and centers on in Ephesians 5, verse 19? He says, make melody, go twitch, twang, of what? What instrument? It is the heart. And therefore, the heart is what the instrument that he has focused in on, not instrumental music or an accompaniment of something else. We see the same type of ver uh, wording being used in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, where he says that you are to sing with grace in your hearts. Okay, so that's the first justif uh, justification that's used or argument that is used. The second one is that it is always been traditionally used in the church. That instrumental music has always been a tradition within the church and therefore gives justification for that. See, but there's a problem with that argument. The first problem that with that argument is the simple fact that the word itself, when we talk about a cappella, we are talking about, we understand that the dictionary defines a cappella as using or singing without the accompaniment of, of instrumental music. But do you know where that word a cappella comes from? That word a cappella comes from the Italian word meaning in church style or in chapel style. And what it was referring to is that in church style during the church time frame, when this word came about, they did not have instrumental music. They was only vocal. But that doesn't really kind of fly with some. So let's look at just what history teaches us. In about 667 AD, that was the first instrument that was introduced in a Catholic service. And it was an organ. And it was, when it was introduced, it was met with opposition. So much so that they had to take the organ away. And it was not reintroduced until 775 AD. 
And this was even with opposition, but they still remained and remains today. Now, when we look at this, what, why does that make such a difference? Because it's almost 700 years after the establishment of the church that the first instrumental music is used. And that makes a difference. Because if the early church is not using it, but then 700 years later, we start to use it, that's a problem. But let's go ahead and say, traditionally, it is used. If it is, if tradition is going to be our justification, what did Paul just tell us? In, or, or I'm not Paul, what did Christ just tell us in Matthew chapter 15, verse 9? Remember when he goes ahead and he says, they were elevating their traditions above the commandments of God? And he classified it as vain worship? Well, brethren, if we start to use traditions and we say that we find no scriptural background within the, the uh, Bible showing us to use the uh, instrumental music, but because tradition has it, then we are going to go ahead and do that. We are doing the very same thing that the Pharisees were doing. And we must remember that John tells us in John, uh, 2 John chapter 1, verse 9, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. We must not go beyond what the scriptures teach us. We must not go ahead and try and insert our institute or insert our own traditions above the word of the Lord. But let's look at the very last one. Today we'll look at three t tonight. We're going to come back to this. The very last one that we look at is the justification that is used. It says the Bible doesn't necessarily or specifically say that it's wrong. It doesn't say it doesn't or you shouldn't. See, the argument here is dependent upon the silence of the scriptures as its approval for action. But when we look at this, we automatically start with the first problem, right? The first problem is that we find that there is in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19 and Colossians 3 verse 16 that we're told we're to sing and make melody with our hearts. There's instruction that is given. So how do they come up with this? The thought process here is that yes, there's instruction that we are to make melody in our hearts, but the Lord is silent on any other instruments to be used. And therefore, that gives us justification or the latitude to be able to use anything else. And that is a ridiculous argument. I just start off with that. Why, why do I say that it's a ridiculous argument? Because first of all, when God commands us to do something, when he says, you shall do this or you will do that, he, and he does not qualify it with, oh, and by the way, don't do this and don't do that and do, do this. What does that tell us about what he has told us to do? That that is binding. That we must follow that word. And that any other substitution is against his word. But let me kind of bring it into like a home kind of setting. Because none of us would adopt this type of frame of mind in the things that we do on everyday life. Imagine you go to a mechanic. And you go to the mechanic and you ask them for an oil change. And you leave for the day, you come back, and the mechanic tells you, I've done the oil change, the oil change is completed. Oh, by the way, I also repainted your car, changed your tires, and have replaced your engine. It is now $15,000 you owe me. And you turn around and you say, hold on a minute. I came in here for an oil change. Oil change. Why in the world did you do all of this? And he says, well, yeah, you told me I had authorization to do the oil change, but you didn't tell me I didn't have authorization to do all the other things. That's, none of us would accept that. None of us would go ahead and say, well, that makes complete sense. Because we all understand that authorization hasn't been given to that specific things. If we went into court, the court would decide on our favor. We understand that for our secular kind of views of life, our, our societal views of life. But then we try and use these same type of arguments within the Bible. And we go ahead and say, well, you know what? God didn't say, and therefore that gives me authorization to do. And that's not the case. You see, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, when Moses is told to go and build an ark of gopher wood, the Lord didn't say, and don't build it out of spruce, and don't use oak, and don't make sure you're not using mahogany. No, he just said, build it out of gopher wood, and that's what he built it out of. He didn't have to put a negative command in there to understand. 
But do we ever see where something that is not commanded is then enforced in force? And the answer is yes. Turn with me to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 10. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, here we have the story of Nadab and Abihu. And we are told in verse 1, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Now notice here that the Lord did not specify other types of strange fire. He just said, use a specific thing. They neglected to do so, and therefore they suffered the consequence which was their life. We are the exact same thing. We have to understand the exact same thing applies to us. In Revelation chapter 18, verses 19, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. We're told about the book of Revelation that any who add to that book will add to himself the plagues that are written. And any who take away from that book will also take away from his, the, the tree of life and also the holy city. And we understand that that applies to everything within the scriptures. Because all scriptures are the inspired word of God. And we have no right, no authority to go ahead and meddle with it. But you also understand, I want you to think of it this way as well. It's about faith. You know, we talked about faith this morning in our Bible study. But I want you to think of it this way. You see, we have to have faith in the Lord and we have to have respect for his commands. But we also have to have faith and respect for his silence and treat them as commands. You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul warns the Corinthians about exceeding what is written. We need to not exceed what is written either. We're told specifically that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. And then we talked about this morning in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that we are to have faith because it is impossible to please the Lord without it. But let me ask you the question, how do I get that faith? How does that faith kind of, how do I, I get that? Well, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 tells us exactly how we get it. Because we're told that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So we get it by the authorization within the word. Now, anything that is derived outside of that authorization, we're also told something specifically about it. See, in Romans chapter 14, verse 23, Paul says, whatever is not of faith, it is sin. We have to understand that if we are doing things against the authorization, against what the word tells us, it is not by faith. And therefore, it is classified as a different type of worship. And we talked about the type of worship this is. Because the argument here of, well, God didn't say so, and that gives me justification, is not really justifying what the Lord has said. It is justifying what I want to do. It is justifying what I feel or what I like or what I desire, and therefore it is will worship. And we have to be careful. Now we're going to stop here this morning, and we're going to come back in the evening service, and we're going to examine three additional arguments that are used also for instrumental. I pray that you will join us this morning, uh, this evening. And today, we've taken some time to look at the three different types of incorrect worship, the one that the Lord tells us, which is true worship that we must have. And then we looked at and examined three different justifications that are used within society to justify instrumental music. And we looked at how the scriptures talk completely against those things and refute that. I hope that this has clarified some about what we're supposed to be doing and why we do what we do in the song service. But I ask you, if you're one who has not gone ahead and accepted Christ. And I ask each and every one of you, are you offering true worship to God? See, that's the question we must all answer. If you're one who has not accepted Christ, has not confessed his name, has not repented of your sins and been baptized into the remission of your sins and now walks with Christ, if you haven't accepted the gospel call, I will tell you, you have no worship that is true worship. Because we're told in John chapter 14, verse 6, by Christ, I am the truth 
I am the way and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. But you can change that. You can make that change today by just simply obeying the gospel call. Or if you're one who has already done so and you look at your life and notice that you need the prayers of the saints, you need the help of the saints, we can do that as well. Please let us pray on your behalf. Let us help you in any which way that we can. If there's any way or if there's anything that you are in need of and are subject to the invitation, please come forward as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.